Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. So, uh, Divya, would you like to lead us in prayer? It's okay with you. All right, anyone, anyone can lead in prayer. It's Sally, Go ahead, Divya. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, time that you have given us. Uh, thank you for your goodness, your mercies, uh, your provision. Uh, Father, thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you for bringing us together uh, once again for um, the session. Uh, we thank you, Father, for the truths that we are learning. Uh, we pray, Father, that you enable us, Father, to um, understand, to perceive, to be receptive, uh, Father, to uh, your word, to these concepts, Father, Lord, that uh, we may be able to practice it, Father, that we may be able to um, act according to your will in these areas, Father, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given. Father, we pray uh, for Pastor Paul. Uh, Father, we pray for your enablement, Lord, your strength, your grace, your wisdom upon him. Uh, also, we pray, Father, for all the um, uh, classmates, Father, Lord, we pray, Father, that you um, strengthen each one of us, Father, and uh, help us, Father, uh, with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We, all these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Divya. All right. So last class, we looked at the vision of uh, a cell church, then we looked at what a cell church is. Uh, we saw that it was a, it's a it's a microcosm of the kingdom of God. It's a it's a unit of the local church, right? And most importantly, we saw that the uh, it is a biblical pattern. Uh, so when we when we talk about a settled group, uh, we see that the Lord Jesus ministered in small settings in the early church. We look at a lot of examples, uh, and we look at the verses as well where churches and uh people met in smaller settings as well right then we went into why are cell groups important right we looked at uh, uh, about three points we looked at that it's the provision provides the most efficient means of pastoring and evangelism it's a wonderful place to recapture families uh, and we did even number three which was uh it's a way of increasing the church Right now, uh, let's let's stay on this point. Uh, increasing the church. Point number three. Now, when we talk about a cell group, uh, you know, we we can it, since evangelism is part of that cell group, uh, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity to bring people to Christ. And many a times when people come into these cell groups, uh, you know, and, and you know they are saved and. Uh, they are ministered to in the cell group. Eventually, they normally would prefer to get into a local church, right? The more effective a church is in meeting the needs of its members, the greater the positive impact on the church growth, right? So cell groups uh, play a vital role, a very major role in terms of building uh, spiritual building and nurturing of a church. Remember, we talked about this last week. Uh, on Sunday, the pastor preaches. There's worship. The pastor preaches. Everyone go back home. But the cell group is a place of building up, nurturing, and mentoring. Right? Uh, let's go to the next point. It is a perfect place to make disciples. Discipleship of believers takes place effectively in small groups. Now, there are a lot of discipleship programs. There are discipleship, uh, you know, life coaching is something that we have at APC. Uh, you know, we can attend two days seminar or maybe a five month course or 10 month, one year course on discipleship. Uh, now, what is important is that you must understand that making disciples is an ongoing process. It doesn't just happen you know overnight or it doesn't happen uh you know maybe in one year it, it does, you know as we know that discipleship is a process that goes on and on look at the example of jesus he chose 12 disciples 
and he, for three and a half years, he was ministering to them. Can we say that after three and a half years, they were all set to take up the mantle of, uh, you know, going out and reaching and reaching out and sharing the message of Jesus? I don't think so, because a lot of them were towards the end of the three and a half years. One of them disowned him, and then the other eleven were uh, fearful and weary. They had no idea what to do. Uh, so when it comes to discipleship, it is life to life mentoring, right? Uh, you're speaking your life into the other person's life. It's life to life. It's not all. It's not on paper, right? On paper, it's a different story, right? So, for example, we can study a lot of things in the Bible, right? and I can I can teach you, right? I, 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 as we are doing right now, we are teaching, right? But mentoring is more than just teaching, more than just preaching. Mentoring is about life to life. The moment I'm, uh, you know, as a as a mentor, I, I should be able to open my life, share about my failures, my uh, the things where I've gone wrong and the things that worked out where I was successful, and it's more about life than life. Right? Next point. Small groups is an uh, is a is a wonderful place of having true fellowship and edification. Right? We build meaningful relationships, especially in a church which is you know, I, I would say if the church comes up to more than 200 people, uh, sometimes we can get lost. But, uh, but now we have wonderful churches which have 400, 500, thousands of people. That's wonderful, right? Because God said, I will build my church. I will add people into the kingdom of God. And it's, uh, we're not against churches growing in numbers, right? But when we look at growth, or we must also see spiritual growth. Building meaningful relationships can be hard in larger gatherings, but in small groups, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it is where you can have true fellowship. Relationships are built, right? uh, uh, and and each of them can, you know, spend time. Bonding of people happens, edification happens. Right? Remember, the Apostle Paul said, "Edify each other." through the word and through love. Right? So we edify each other, we build each other up. Cell groups is a wonderful, next point, cell groups is a wonderful place for to exercise spiritual gifts. Right? Uh, and and when, we, when we talk about small groups, uh, the beautiful aspect of a small group is that you can be yourself. And many a times we come to church and uh, Sometimes, you know, we try to be somebody who we are not. Uh, but in a cell group, you can just be who you are. Right? Yeah. All masks come off. You can just be who you are. Now, for example, I remember this long time back, this, uh, this, this young boy, uh, you know, he didn't really believe in speaking in tongues. And, uh, and he was part of our church. And, uh, he didn't believe in it, right? Uh, but he wasn't against it. He just didn't believe. It. Uh, and then, uh, you know, he started going to a life group. Uh, after he started attending a life group, uh, you know, it, it, there was not much of speaking in tongues. But what uh, some of our youth were doing is they used to sing in tongues and used to uh, every now and then they would pray in tongues. But he would feel very uncomfortable, right? Uh, and then some some of our youth began to speak to him and, uh, you know uh, after many months of explaining to him through the scriptures you know this is what the bible teaches us and this is what the gift of the holy spirit is and it's available for uh, so over time he began to understand and god you know in his grace uh, filled him with the holy spirit and he began to also speak in tongues but it took him about six months in a small group, right? But in that small group, he was able to open up. He was able to be himself. Uh, he, you know, he was sharing with me the other day, he was saying, uh, all of them used to pray and speak in tongues, but I was the only person who was able to pray and you know, sing in tongues. 
but I still felt like home in this small group. And that's a that's how a cell group must be. We don't judge each other. We don't look at each other and judge each other by their gifts and talents and all of it. Uh, but it's a place of just you know exercising, stepping out of your comfort zone. Right. And, and and there are many testimonies of you know people who uh, didn't like to pray uh, you know, in public or they didn't know how to pray in public. But small groups enabled them to step out of their comfort zone. There were people who uh, didn't like to sing or raise their hands in public, right? And uh, but through the small groups, they were able to step up. Right? And then next point: raising up leaders. Now, every cell member, in, especially in APC, what we want to see is every cell member becoming a cell leader. So right now, we have about 40 life groups. Each life group has an average of about 8 to 10 people. And we intentionally kept it that way. Uh, the moment a life group becomes more than 12, we make sure that, you know, we divided it into two so that you, know, you have the life group leaders able to minister to each of them on a personal level. Now, why do we do that? Because it's not that we want life groups with 50, 60 people. That's, that's not the point. The point is, if I have to raise up a leader, I need to be able to take the responsibility of speaking into his life. I need to make the time. I need to share things in my life. I need to be able to speak into that person's life. Now remember, leaders, there are two kinds of leaders. One are born leaders, one are made leaders. And you look at some people who know there's a spirit of leadership in them. Then you look at some people, very shy, very quiet, or, you know, uh, don't really talk much, but then they become great leaders, right? Uh, the, I would say one of the major responsibilities of a cell group is to raise up leaders. Right? A cell leader must take the responsibility of raising up leaders. So one of the things that I do for our life groups is if there are life groups which are more than probably two years, uh, they're functioning for about two years, uh, I speak to the life group leader and I say, hey, it's been two years that you've been ministering to these people. Who is going to be, you know, who is a potential leader you have raised up? So we can ask to start a new life group. Uh, and so we, we'd like to do that, right? So even before a life group starts, yesterday we, uh, I just spoke with a person and we are starting a new life group. It's a family life group. Right? And, I, and I told him, I said, brother, you're starting this Saturday. See, tomorrow is his first session. I said, the day you start, you must also think about who can be the next leader for this life. Or who, I, who can I raise as a leader that can start a life group and mentor another 10 or 12 people? Raising up leaders is, 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 is very important, and life groups, cell groups, is the perfect place to do that, right? because we can speak into their lives. Number eight, accountability. Now, this word, uh, accountability, uh, somewhere, uh, I would say, especially in church, when you talk about church globally, uh, worldwide, the citywide church, or worldwide church. Accountability is something that is slowly being taken out. Right? Why? Because we have leaders who are pioneers. And, uh, well, there's no accountability. They can say what they want to say. They can do what they want to do. And so, And they don't have to report to anybody. But remember that uh, accountability is whether you are a pioneer, whether you are working in the ministry, the workplace, accountability is important. I would say even on a personal level, I picture this, you're at home, you have, uh, you know, you have a family, you have children, you want to be accountable to them. You've got to be able to, uh, you know, if, if you have a wife or you have a husband, you, you need to be accountable to them, to the children as well. 
right? So every member of the church has a certain accountability. Now, whether we fulfill that, that is secondary, but there is an accountability. What is it? To evangelize, to grow spiritually, and to fulfill his part of the vision to the fullness of his or her capacity. So this not only includes uh, you know, evangelism and church attendance, but it's also the ministries that he or she can be involved in. Now, as cell group leaders, we encourage them to be accountable. Now, accountability can start small, in small ways, and also, you know, this we've got to be accountable in bigger things as well. So, for example, Saturday is life group. So, a basic, uh, uh, you know, aspect, a basic thing that a, le a leader should do is inform the members. Okay, we yeah, have life group. This is the time. This is the place. This is what we're going to discuss. And this is the agenda for the life group. It's being accountable, right? Uh, initially, what we used to do is we used to have life group leaders' reports. So, uh, you know, we I used to request the life group leaders to email in your report. So uh, it would be basically a monthly report. So throughout the month, if you've met every week, what what was it? Uh, how was the discussions? Were there any questions? So they send a whole report. Uh, if you meet once in two weeks, a monthly report is sent. Right? Uh, and, and it's good to be accountable. Right? So right now, what we do is we meet with our life group leaders at least once a quarter. We meet in person, even though here in Bangalore, we have different locations, everyone in, all across the city. Uh, it's hard to get everyone at times, but we, we try to meet on a call uh, or we meet personally. Why? There's the same sense of accountability. They are accountable. We are also accountable. Uh, and, and and so that when we are accountable, uh, there is uh, you know uh, productivity is easily measured. Let's see. Okay, uh, this cell group is doing well. This cell group is you know needs some help, so we can help them out. Right. Number nine. Avoid continuation of dead programs right now the health of a cell group is very important uh, if you have a cell group and we're just meeting but but nothing is there's no outcome of it so for example there's a cell group that is happening and it's been two years and in two years right uh, we don't see any spiritual growth. Right now, I'm just giving this example, right? So, example: a, a person comes to the life group, and he says, "Hey, um, I'm not comfortable praying in public because these are the things I." Oh, but after two years, if he still feels that I'm not comfortable in praying in public, he or she, uh, we need to you know, ask ourselves, "What's you know?" Because we need to see change. We need to see spiritual growth in people's lives. So uh, it's very important to avoid dead programs, right? Programs that can you know, take up time, yet they may look good on the outside, uh, but are of no use. Right? Uh, now, I'm not saying don't have programs. We encourage our life group leaders. We say, hey, you know, go out, reach out, evangelize. Uh, we also help them during Christmas time if they want to go out to children's homes, orphanages, do all of that. Right? Uh, but the moment you feel that if your cell group is not growing in a spiritual level, number one, first reach out to your pastor. Reach out to your leaders, right? Or, or within the cell group itself. Talk to each other. You know what, what are we not doing right is it some is there something that's missing um are we not open to the leading of the holy spirit what are we doing right um so we can you know just work together but if you feel that there is something that is is dead and it's not bearing any fruit just, you know try to avoid that right uh, 
and then make sure that the health of the life group is strong. So there should be, people should be ministered. Number one, it's about people. People should be ministered. After, you know, a couple of months, they must feel that, hey, um, I, I don't want to miss life group. I need to go because I can hear the word, I can discuss the word, I can be open here. They must feel that. If they're not feeling that, uh, we need to, you know, uh, discuss and see how to get people interested uh, to be part of cell group. Right? So, what does a cell church look like? So, number one, we saw what is a cell group. We saw what is a cell church. Cell groups is a ministry of a church. Right? A cell church focuses only on small groups. So they don't they don't always they don't want to do events and uh, programs. Try to they don't focus on that. So this is the difference. Right? So we saw what is. Uh, why why cell groups are important. Now we're going to look at what a cell church looks like. In Bangalore, uh, in cities, in the city that we stay in, I've not really seen a cell church. Um, but in in states up north India, there are plenty of them, right? Uh, plenty, plenty of uh, church. And they could be in even in cities. Uh, but in, in the north of India, there are plenty of churches which are basically cell churches. So what does a cell church look like? Right? Let's look at those few points on your notes. Uh, would you like me to uh, you know, present the notes? Would that be easier for you? Uh, or if you have your notes open, then you can just look at it. Uh, let me know. If you, do you want me to present the notes? Is it fine? OK. You just you just put a message in if you'd like if you want me to present the notes okay Oops, sorry. Okay, everyone can see this? Oh, sorry, I, I just need to. All right, so. Okay, so what does a cell church look like? Okay, so when you talk about a cell church, what, what does it look like? Does it look like a regular church service that we have every Sunday? Does it look like, uh, you know, just a few people gathering in a small setting and they just sing a few songs, pray and go home? What does it look like? Well, uh, let's look at a few points here. A cell church has Sunday celebration services like any other church. Right. They come together for worship, for preaching of the word, and they and to keep in sync with the overall direction of the local church. Right. So so basically, when you look at a cell church, it looks like a regular church. Right? Nothing changes. Only thing you may not have, you know, big LED screen and all of that. But it looks like a regular church. Right. Uh, they meet during the week, but here's the difference now. 
They can either meet once a week, they can meet twice a week. Right? Now, for example, life groups in, 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 in Bangalore, we have some that meet every week, some that meet once in two weeks. Uh, but when you look at a cell church, they meet every week for sure, or they meet twice a week. Right? Uh, and you know, different churches or different uh, ministries will have different structures. Uh, let me give you this example. Uh, you can have a church with cell church which has worship for 30 minutes, get into the Lord's table and a few announcements of what's going to happen. Uh, then some churches can have testimony time, right? So you have testimony, and then you get into God's word, right? And then you have probably 15, 20 minutes of prayer and close. So the agenda can vary from cell groups to cell groups. Now you may have another church, a cell church, which can start with half an hour of prayer, get into worship, uh, get into the announcements, get into the word, and then end with the Lord's table. So the the structure, the agenda may be different, but they have the Sunday service, right? And again, it's a place to build strong relationships. Everyone feels loved and cared. People in need are ministered to right away. Okay, so for example, uh, in a church, you want to meet with the pastor. The pastor's finished preaching, and you have about 500 people in the church by standing in line to meet with the pastor. Now, the pastor may not have time to you, the line may be so long that you'll feel, oh man, I, I just need, I, let's make, let me go home. Or we may feel, uh, you know, the pastor may not have time to, you know, sit and talk. But here in a cell group, people are ministered to right away, right? So, for example, uh, in a, in a, you know, the pastor can be traveling on ministry. He can be on a break. He can be on a holiday. But he got when the cell group pastors are there, they are available to minister one on one right away. Ministry is done through cell groups. Uh, they do not have to wait for the church to start a ministry or a program. Cell leader takes the opportunity and works together to get uh, get the work, the ministry work started, and keep growing continuously. Right? Uh, souls are continuously being added to the kingdom. The church and its ministries are focused on building leaders and providing training. Now, remember, uh, a local church. And a cell church, okay. They both can have can have overlapping, uh, you know, uh, the 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 ideas, the strategies can overlap, right? A local church also wants to build leaders. It's not like it's only the cell group leaders or cell church wants to, you know, they want to raise up leaders mm -hmm. in a local church. So they could then it's always an overlap. Uh, you know, a, a, cell, a regular church will want to train people and build people up in the world. So also in a cell church. Uh, so we see that overlap is there. Uh, but even as with that overlap, it's just that the cell group, you can go into detail, right? So the vision of the church permeates the entire church structure. Every individual is possessed by the vision, vision of the church. Every individual uh, will wants to, you know, they grip with the vision of the church. Now, again, uh, it's not that in a cell church there's no vision, right? Uh, it's there, right? Uh, now, let's look at the next one. There are occasional events, special meetings, crusades, and seminars that cells are involved in, and they get everyone in the cell group to participate. So, so when you look at the local church and a cell church, um, there is an overlap, but there is there are differences, right? Uh, when when you're part of a 
local church and when you're part of a cell group you will see uh, you can see that you can see the difference right now look at these examples of cell churches i'm sure all of us may have heard of uh, david paul yonki cho right a powerful powerful minister of god god just touched his life as a young boy uh, uh, probably at the age of 18 19 young boy he had some illness uh, very soft spoken young boy but god touched his life and uh, you know, uh, he started this church in Seoul, uh, Seoul Korea. Uh, look at this. Look at just a few aspects of what happened uh, in his church. The church began 19, 1959, sorry, 1958. Here are the three keys in the church. Number one was prayer, cell groups, let my people grow and go. Now, uh, here's the thing I want to uh, just sorry. look at these three points prayer, cell groups, let my people grow and grow. So when David Yongicho he started, he, he had these three aspects and he writes a lot about it in his book forget the name of, I think it's the five dimensions of the church, uh, but you can uh, 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 go online and check. He, he writes a detailed description of how God just gave him these ideas and strategies and uh, you know he was able to build the largest church in the entire world. Right? Uh, prayer, cell groups, and the purpose of the cell group was for people to grow and to go. So, for David, for Yong, David Paul Yonggi Cho, his, his strategy was not, okay, I need thousands of people or lakhs of people coming and sitting for the Sunday service. That was not his intention at all. His intention was, I need to reach out to people. And when I reach out to these people, these people must grow, become leaders. And they should go out and do something for God. So you see the mindset there. Right? It was not like, okay, they should grow and they should serve. No. He wanted, his, his vision was to expand, to raise up leaders. And these leaders will go out and raise up another 10 or 100 leaders. And those 100 will go out and raise up another 100 leaders. So, uh, you know, just a ripple effect. But look at what happened in the first six years without the system of cell groups right so imagine this the church for the first six years had no cell groups and later on after that he initiated the cell group model right now let's read look at this uh exodus 18 21 Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Right? This is when uh, uh, Moses' uh, father-in-law comes and gives some instructions, says, hey, Moses, you're a leader. What are you doing looking after these small aspects? You are up there. You need to look after the spiritual uh, aspect of the people of Israel. You are looking at, you know, why are these two people fighting? Why are they uh, upset with each other? No. Uh, so uh, his father-in-law says, this is what you do. Get people and put them over ru as rulers over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties and tens. With this in mind, David Yonggi Cho was started the cells among women. What started with one or two went on to become 65,000 cell groups. That number is, you know, when you think about it now, it looks unrealistic. But it's not unrealistic. That's what really happened. 65,000 cell groups. And the church membership 
went up to 750,000 members. How? Through cell groups. Because what he did was he appointed cell leaders. He said, you go out, bring people, minister to people. And what happened was when they were able to do that, the cell groups just began to multiply and multiply and multiply. And towards the end, 750 members within the church. Right. So we see that the cell group model is, uh, is a successful model that, uh, you know, later on we'll talk about it, whether cell groups are relevant for the generation that we are living in. And some of you may ask, hey, but this is 19... 50s, late 1950s, early 1960s, people didn't have much to do, but now we're all busy, we don't have time. Uh, it's all true, but doesn't mean that the cell church model is not effective. It is yet, even now, very, very effective. Let's look at the second example, the International Charismatic Mission in Bogota, Colombia. Now, if you look at the 1980s, Colombia was a place infested with drugs. It is known for its drugs. It's known for its gangsters. And uh, and it, it was known as, uh, even though being a third world country during that time, uh, you know, resources were less. Uh, uh, only, you know, cocaine and all these drugs were the source of income for uh, the people of Colombia. and. Uh, uh, you know, there was no proper management system. The government was failing. Uh, but in 1983, God used uh, this wonderful ministry called the International Charismatic Mission in Bogota, Colombia. Now, Bogota is uh, it's not not just it was not a city, but it's a town uh, in Colombia, a growing town. So look at what happened began in 1983, groups of 12 cell groups and evangelism. For the first seven years, worked with David Yonggi Cho's system, and the church grew to 3,000 members. Right, So he did something very, uh, very smart. Right? So he's a, he, what he did was he, he took his... Uh, he, he probably read about David Yonggi Cho, he, used his ideas and for the first seven years through cell groups 3,000 members were added into the church and he started to focus on planting new cells instead of multiplying existing groups right so 2,400 cell groups 350,000 members now remember this is the 1980s there are crime was at its peak but God used it. God used the cell groups to touch and minister to people. And I'm sure there would have been hundreds and thousands of testimonies during this time. 350,000 members uh, added into the church. Right? Let's look at uh, some more, just a few more here. Uh, churches that have implemented the G12 model. Uh, and we'll talk about more of the G12 uh, in, in the next class and what we have also done is we've done the APC 12 model that's how we we've taken it from here and we're applying it here at APC but uh, what is the G12 model G12 model is these are the churches that have applied it right uh, Harvest Assembly in the US Christian Center in Ecuador Kensington Temple in England Bethany World Press Center in uh, Louisiana the USA uh, so what do these churches uh, you know what what is it about the g12 principles right uh, those churches following the g12 principles uh, as opposed to the entire model are, are too numerous to name so let me let me just briefly explain what this g12 model is the g12 model was basically a cell leader was appointed and under that cell leader they would have 12 people that this one leader will minister to. 
the moment the group becomes 30, right? the moment the group becomes more than 12, 30, a new leader is appointed to look after the, you know, the, the other group. So let, let, let me just paint this picture for you. So you've got one leader. He's got seven people in the cell group. Six months down the line, it becomes 12 people. Now, one more person wants to join that group. So when it becomes 13, this cell group leader must have already raised up another leader. And this other leader is appointed as a cell group leader. And he starts with that one person. Then that cell group continues to grow and becomes 12. And then when it becomes 13, it again, a new group is started. Now, why, why 12? Uh, there's no reason why 12. It just said, with one person, one cell group leader, 12 people is a good number that he can look after. Right? Like really speak into their lives, spend time with them. Imagine you have a cell group and you have some 20 people in that cell group. Uh, it's just going to be a prayer group. It's just going to be a, you know, uh, another meeting. Because you're not able to spend time uh, or, or minister to them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So the G12 model and the G12 principle really took off in the early 80, 1980s, 1990s. Many, many, many churches uh, began to use this model. And they also saw the fruit of this model. It, it worked. Uh, People's lives were touched. People were getting ministered. Re leaders were being raised. Discipleship was happening. Uh, and, and so many churches began to apply this model, uh, even as they uh, you know, continue to build the ministry. So here's the question that uh, we want to ask. Will the cell church concept work in your city? Will it work in the city? Now. The answer is a resounding yes. Yet, there are challenges that, that we will see. There, there are challenges. But let's look at why the cell church concept works, even in a city. Regardless of region, regardless of culture, regardless of status, we can be rich, poor, we can be from a certain culture, it can be from a certain region. It doesn't matter why. People are created to have relationships. So when you and I, for example, we start a cell church, we invite people. Sometimes they may say, no, I don't want to come. But remember that people are created to have relationships. Right? Jesus, being the son of God, he could have done everything on his own, but he didn't do it. He, he used people, ordinary people. He built relationships with them and he used them, right? Uh, and I always use this example. In 2020, we saw COVID and the lockdown. We were all locked up in our rooms, in our homes. How many of us felt, oh man, I need to speak to somebody face to face? Because why? Why is that feeling coming? Because we are built, we are created to have relationships. Right? Uh, we cannot be, you know, no matter how much we do things online. Uh, you know, recently I was speaking to a, a young man in his early 30s, and he was, he's, uh, he was saying, he, he works from home, right? So the entire, there's no office in India, right? So there's no going out at all. All he has to do is work from home. So there are no people to, uh, con to speak with in, in terms of his colleagues. Everything is done through either through the instant chat. There's no office itself in India. So he was telling me, I don't have friends. I don't have people who I can talk to. The church is the only only on Sundays, and he is also part of a uh, cell group. And he says only on Sunday and cell group I get to talk to people. Otherwise, no. 
because Monday to Friday I work from home. And he's saying, I feel lonely at times. I, I feel lonely. I don't know what to do. I, sometimes I, I don't know what to talk. I've lost the interest of, uh, you know, sometimes I can't frame a sentence properly because I've just been working from home. Right. So remember that people are created to have relationships. So definitely, you use the cell group, people will come. They may have work, they may not have work, they may be busy, they may not be busy. Uh, but there are times people can put aside 10 other things and come to your life group because there's life there. Right? Two, in general, people are hospitable and like to visit in homes. The moment you tell somebody, hey, why don't you come to church, they may take a step back. But home is a different setting. right? Uh, normally, eight out of nine, ten times, uh, when you invite a person home, come visit, they will come. Right? So it gives us an opportunity. Three, cells allow the unsaved to explore without being very public about their interest. Now, this is, uh, I'll just share a few things here and bring this session to a close. There are many testimonies that happen even in our church where, uh, you know, we have people coming from different parts of the states from India and they come into Bangalore and uh, uh, people from other faiths as well. So we had a couple of youth, uh, and this is over time, over the years, uh, youth that who were who were invited by friends they came into church they were unbelievers but the lord touched their heart and uh, you know they they became believers uh, but initially they were very weary oh, how can i go to church am i doing something wrong uh, what if my parents get to know what if uh, what if god is upset uh, you know they had a lot of questions so what they did was, what we did was, we connected them to cell groups, to life groups. Said, okay, this is not a church service, but it's a place where you have questions, you can go and ask. So there were a couple of girls, um, two, three boys that we know of. So the girls, we sent them to some of the girls' life groups, the boys, we sent them to the boys' life groups. And there, they began to ask a lot of questions. Why do you do this? Why do you have this, you know, Lord's table? Why do you sing songs? Why do you pray so? They have just simple questions. But they began to explore. They, it, it was a safe environment for them. And for about one and a half to two years, they were only attending life groups. And they came to a certain level of maturity. They were growing in the Lord. And they said, no, I need to go to church. They understood. So they themselves decided, no, I'll come to church. So they began to come to church. And they began to serve. And they, uh, they finished their studies. Gone, some of them have gone back to their hometown. Some of them are still here. But you see that it gave the cell, the life group was the place where they began to learn and grow. They never attended church, not up to about one and a half to two years. Uh, so it's a wonderful place for uh, the unsaved, especially to, you know, uh, a comfortable, safe environment to ask questions and to learn and grow. What are some of the challenges we see? Uh, and what are some of the solutions? Uh, challenges, people have long working hours, uh, odd timings, right? Solution is we can have workplace cell groups, uh, cell groups at, uh, at home, at homes close by or even in, uh, coffee centers or anything that can uh, make them be available for uh, just meeting together, right? Uh, so, oh, actually, we'll stop here because we lost time. So we can start next week. We'll just look at a few of the possible challenges and I'll just share a few examples as well and how we were able to, uh, you know, just uh, work through those challenges, bring up solutions. Uh, and, uh, and then we can continue from there, right? All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, see you next week. Have a great week ahead. God bless you all. Bye now.